Right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello, my name's Sarah. I probably don't know some of you. Um, and I work as one of the diagnosticians at Axia. Um, I'm also autistic and I uh, facilitate this group. Sometimes it's me, sometimes we have speakers for any of you who've, who've not, not been before. Um, I'd like anybody here, we always have a few people from Axia here um, who some of you may well not know. So if anybody from Axia to begin with can stand up briefly or wave their hand in the air and introduce themselves. Should we start over here? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sue, so I'm company secretary and the educational lead at Axia. So, hello. Okay. Uh, I'm Linda, one of the directors and clinical psychologists. A dream and keep the website up for the best account. I'm Linda, part of the admin team. Thank you. Thank you. So we also part of the admin team. Esme and I volunteer at Axia. Thank you. I'm, I'm Ron, I'm one of the admin leaders. I'm a student at Samaritan. I'm trying to clear diagnostics. Uh, I'm, I'm Eric Chapman. I'm also one of the anime leaders. I don't really do much else. Praise the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Co-director of the consultant, and I'm getting my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Still. No. Can you get your ass kicked quietly then, chaps? Uh, she's in Devon at the minute, but my mum. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's not here today. <laughs> okay, right, we shall move on. Uh, who is here for the first time today, just to give us an idea? Yeah, okay, not, not too many. Welcome to, to, to those. Most of you will, will know the rules. I'll just repeat myself just brief, briefly. Um, this is a, a support group rather than a social group. So you don't have to talk to anyone if you don't want to. Uh, it's not about necessarily making friends. It's about just having a space which is a very autistic friendly space. So any supporters, any non-autistic people in the room, um, you are taking second place today. Uh, the main people that we want to hear from and want to participate are, are the autistic people in the room. The non-autistic people, you've got the rest of the world, we just have two hours here. Uh, and, and so that's, that's our kind of, kind of priority really. Um, uh, Obviously, everything here is confidential, but also if you want to say anything, just be cautious about what you're saying, uh, you know, just in case anybody's listening or hearing. Um, the presentation and the first hour is recorded and the audio is put onto the website along with the slides. Uh, so nothing identifying about you. If anybody has a particular problem with that, then we can we can talk to Dream and he can do it fuzzy things or editing or whatever um, like, like that. Uh, people do find it useful to go on the website and, and listen to the audio, uh, again, either for yourselves or people who are not here today. So it's, it's quite a useful thing to, to be able to, to do, just to re recount all of those things. Uh, what else do I need to know? Nope. Um, the clock that we usually have on the wall has disappeared. So if anyone who's relying on that Sorry about that, don't know where it's gone. Um, it is now nine minutes past 12. We will cease at around about one o'clock and we will eat cake and we will drink tea. What are the cake selections this month, please? Callum. <laughs> He's called Calvin. <laughs> Ricotta and lemon tart and a pineapple and pistachio cake. Don't go near that Pokeball. Are either of them gluten or dairy? Uh, the pineapple one is gluten free. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so then we'll have a break for about 20, 25 minutes. What happens after that uh, is Linda will come up and give us a bit of an overview of stuff that's going on in the next month or two and what's happening in Axia um, and then we might have a little bit of time left to just kind of finish up with any questions or thoughts or anything else really. Um, some of you may remember maybe it was about a year or more ago uh, that I did a presentation around friendships and relationships. Um, so some of the slides here are the same, some of them are different. Uh, really it's just a kind of matter of us all sort of I think the value of this group is the opportunity to realise that lots of other people feel the same as you do. And I think for a lot of autistic people, particularly for those of us who've been diagnosed later in life, you can often end up feeling that you're the only one who has those experiences. Um, and so the more you're happy to kind of share and join in, then the more valuable I think, I hope it is uh, for, for everybody. 
so this is my kind of first uh, thought. Um, I think uh, from an autistic perspective, so, so I do a lot of training. I've worked in schools, universities, employers, all sorts of things for, for a very long time um, and met many, many hundreds of autistic people. Um, and I think what seems to be sometimes be a thing is that where non-autistic people seem to find all of the concepts involving people, relationships, friendships, whatever, sort of relatively natural, relatively intuitive, relatively problem free to some degree. It, it seems to me that often autistic people are coming at it in a very different way. They're coming at it in a way of, I need to learn this information. Where can I get this information from in order for me to be able to do that? Is that anything that anyone recognises, that kind of feeling that that I need to study this, I need to analyse it, I need to learn it to understand. There's a few, few kind of nods. Who, who really doesn't feel that that applies to them at all? No? What, what's your kind of perspective about people? Does it feel easy and quite natural? It doesn't feel easy or natural. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel like I need to study. Right. Um, I just sort of, if I experience something that feels like I didn't connect at all with that person, I just wouldn't bother again. Right, okay. So, me that much. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Say, okay, well, that just, just doesn't work there. Yeah, so. yeah, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so are you going to say something at the front? I don't think, in terms of studying it, I just ignore them all together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll come to these differences because they do seem to be exactly as, as you two have experienced, that, that not everybody kind of, kind of feels the same way. Are we in a general agreement that it doesn't necessarily feel like a, a fluid and natural and largely successful enterprise because I my belief hello welcome <laughs> I think it's the case and I'm sure there, there are non autistic people in the room who may wish to disagree but on the whole I would I would guess and again please challenge me if you're not autistic and you want to disagree that for the most part for non autistic people just going to a shop just passing the time of day is, is relatively stress-free. It doesn't involve a lot of energy. It's largely successful. I mean, is that, is that roughly how it feels? You don't really have to think about it. It's, you don't offend people. You don't get it wrong. You don't go away and analyze it or give up because it went wrong. I think for the majority of non-autistic people, the, the basic stuff, of course, friendships and relationships are fraught with difficulties all along the way. Is, is relatively kind of stress-free, but it, it seems to be the case that for autistic people, there's, there's something a little bit more complicated going on, that, that there's something you're not quite picking up or picking it up differently or, or something. So I think typically in the old days, people used to say what these people need, these autistic people need, they need social skills training. Has anybody been inflicted with social skills training? Yes, any comments about that experience? <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Is that was a child or an adult? Um, right, okay. And, and who was that run by? What, what, what was the kind of point behind um, it? It's, it's certainly with work, it was like training courses. It's right. Um, it's because I work customer service, high end customer service. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've done a lot of studying of people, <laughs> probably. Um, as a child, it was it's being pushed by well meaning adults. Or yeah. Adults yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it was interpersonal skills training that you were decided to need in, in, in some way. And, and so you said it was pointless. What, what was wrong with it? What was fundamentally missing? They were coming at it from a neurotypical standpoint. Sure. So obviously, it still didn't make any sense that like they weren't helping me like, learn anything because they weren't on my... Yeah, yeah, no, ab absolutely. So the kind of assumption is if we just give you some tools, you'll be able to go away and do this entirely intuitive process and by... Like, why can't we do it? You're not trying hard enough. What's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. Whereas we know that the diagnostic suggests that if you don't read people's faces terribly well, you wouldn't know who was a friend or who was wanting to engage. You might not pick up on tone of voice just to know whether how somebody was feeling. You, you might not pick up on some very kind of subtle things. So off you go diving in with your tool book um, and, and often end up potentially kind of making it worse be because I believe no one can really teach you 
all of those tiny, tiny kind of, kind of subtleties. Doesn't mean we can't do it in a different way, but the idea of just trying to normalize somebody and turn them into a non-autistic person, it just doesn't really, doesn't really feature or, or, or work. Has anyone found anything that did work, that, that has made all this kind of stuff much easier? Any kind of techniques or, yes, Andy? Um, I've found that playing sport, being good at particular points, yeah. other people, um, came to you to instigate conversation. Yes. And then they're, they're relying on you. They've, got, they've already got something they want off you, and I think in um, your response, you're giving them the answer. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to have some other kind of value other than just being yourself or your personality, that, that being good at something. Anybody else found that being particularly good at something or particularly knowledgeable about something at any point through their lives been useful? Yeah. Yes. do what I know what I'm, do relationships when it's like in a specific environment. Like I also work in customer services and I'm, I'm quite good at that even though it's tiring after a while because I know exactly what I'm expected. Yes. So it's easy yes. and it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Similar. So is that about having a role? Yeah, I think so. A, a sort of status within the job or the skill? Status. But you know, it, you, it is a role you know exactly. Yeah or you can figure it out what you do, because it's quite simple, because they assume that you need to be taught something anyway, so you, yeah. it's easy to pick up, whereas in like with friendships, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 the parameters are quite clear, aren't they? This is what I can do for you. I'm not going to ask you where you've been on holiday or anything like that. It's quite a, a clear thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's easier when there's a a reason to to talk, either a skill or a, or a job of, of 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 some description. So in your lives, who feels that they have sufficient social contacts and network who is satisfied with the amount of they've got <laughs> uh, that's my partner Keith at the back who has no friends whatsoever <laughs> in the whole world that's not a judgment call that's a factual statement apart from me um, so <laughs> so I'm feeling no pressure here than being the only person in his whole world are you, are you, what, tell me, tell us why you're satisfied with no one else in the world except for me. Um, I just like a little someone who I can share a little something with, <laughs> and, and accept me for that. You sound like Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Does that make any sense to anybody? Just a feeling that just if one person gets me, actually that's that that's that's good. Yeah, 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 and, and I, th I think you're someone who's got a one person, aren't, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah, de yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so who feels that their social life is, is adequate, is as, as they would like it to be? Yeah, yeah, a few. Not really, no. I think I try and overcompensate, try and be liked. Right, yeah, and do you think that's and successful? I it once, I need to say it about three times for them to... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be liked. <laughs> and do you think that's whether successful? They can be liked or whether they think it can be a bit creepy, perhaps. <laughs> 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 that's what I'm similar to that is that I think, so I repeat things sometimes with a list of people because I'm like, okay, but are you sure you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't actually ask, ask that. I just sort of say. You just keep yeah, going. No, I do that. <laughs> In my head, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. what do you understand? Yeah. But then I'm saying it again. Yeah. 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 Also, I think sometimes people are a bit, we can be quite, like, similar to what so, you're saying, yeah. we can be quite enthusiastic. Um, and the, the, the other person says, oh, come on, you're being a bit flirty. <laughs> and are you being flirty? Was that your intention? Oh, so how can you be flirty? Oh, right, okay, okay. Just but you're just, yeah. That I, I like to hear better. Wow. As it was. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But there's just some mysterious way that you're saying it that's being mis misread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody else relate to that kind of feeling of maybe trying a little bit too hard sometimes to kind of want to hurry things along in the process of making a friendship? I don't think you are. Not absolutely not. No, they're just not admitting it. It's fine. <laughs> and what were you going to say? Uh, it's just I'd love to have more social. Um, events and occasions and, and 
go to diff different groups, more groups. But it's so mentally exhausted. Yeah, yeah. So the will is there, but the energy's not there. Yeah. And that's yeah. very frustrating yeah. and a bit depressing sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Again, anyone, anyone get that sort of feeling that. And, and, and I think what, what's. Well, Helen's there's absolutely right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Did try a group uh, down the road for a few years, but I mean. Well, it just didn't work out and the answer just stopped going. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 well, just an influence. Yeah, I think there is definitely something about a capacity, isn't there, of, of wanting to do more things, but, but having to be really selective yeah. because there is such a limited amount of energy to, to do that. Sometimes, you know, more typicals can be kind of clicky. I think even autistic people can become quite clicky between yeah. their own like group. So if you try to then get involved with that group, it's quite hard to get into that group. Yeah, that very true. Yes, very yeah. true. Very Unless true. you go in week in, week out every week. Yeah. I think that's probably the same for everyone, isn't it? There's something about frequency of meeting people in any group, isn't there? Mm. Right. I think those are called friends when you meet the same people. <laughs> You're just bored with us all quickly. New, more people, more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very much so. Mm. I've got that many like special interests, but I find them more interesting than like I've got one or two friends, but I only see them every. Like six to twelve months, and they say something about anything I'm interested in. Right. Yeah. So, given the choice, if you had a choice of going out with a friend or doing your own stuff, how many time you'd always choose your own stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it was Tony Atwood who said something about who's a famous writer, professor in autism. Um, autism is someone who found something better to do than socialise or, or something like that. Um, so are you ever lonely? Are you genuinely absolutely happy? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think we've talked about this before, but a lot of autistic people are lonely, aren't they? Yeah. There is a, a, kind of, a kind of loneliness, but I think, yeah. We're happy being alone. Yes. But there are days, times, or points in your life where it feels, oh, this has changed. This is more like lonely. And it's when you realise I haven't got any options. That's all. Yes. Of thing. Okay. So you end up yes. Your mother's for the day. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think you're, it's, this, it's kind of comes into this, what I think is a bit of a kind of paradox that we kind of want to be with people, but we hate them at the same time. And, and, then, and then you're kind of lonely, but you also need to be alone at the same time. Does, does that make sense to, to anyone? Well, so you're always yeah, in this kind of... more need than the, the average person to be alone. Yes. One yes, alone. yes. Yes, I think I think you're right. Yeah. Because some of the people that you're around don't seem to be on the same way. Exactly. Literally alone in a crowded room. Absolutely, absolutely, and and that comes up a lot with teenagers, where they're desperately wanting to be liked, but the people they want to be liked by are not people that they relate to or respect. So, so you're kind of weirdly trying to appeal to a bunch of people that you don't really like. That you don't really like. But because there isn't anyone else, 
you're in this kind of weird situation where, where I can't be me because I want someone to like me, but actually there's all these idiots out there who, who, are, you know, who have different interests than me and, and you know, just, just quite different, are much more social people. And, and often autistic people can be quite judgmental about non-autistic people, uh, about the way those, you know, other people are more social, about the way, who wants to admit to being quite judgmental about, yep, okay, good, excellent. Um, but if that's all there is to gain approval from, you, you're kind of almost forced to kind of sleep with the enemy in a way, you know, in order to, to try and find someone that thinks you're, you're okay. And like that, it, that's kind of, a, I guess, a, a bit of what you're saying, Dream, about if there are no other options, you kind of have to take what there is. And, and I think that leads to a lot of people getting quite, quite messed, messed up uh, um, about that. Um, yeah. Just one thing that I find extremely difficult is everything um, that you do is tacked on with a drink and a chat. Right. So if you want to do anything, go out for a coffee. Whatever it is, <laughs> the worst one is like going to do that for a coffee. Right. And you just want to do the activity yeah. and not do the fluffy stuff around the edge. Or, or the environment where the drink and chat is. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which I guess for some people is missing the point of, of the friendship development, that it's actually the drink and the chat is the real deal for them, whereas you're going for, for the activity um, it, it, itself. I can't, I can't communicate, I yeah. Is it enjoyable in any way to do that? Do you want to do it? I have to do it the other way around. Right. To build something to chat about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. And we, we, this came up when we, were, we did a session about exercise, which was quite often um, that everything you do involves something social, like martial arts classes or, or French lessons or whatever. Um, and I, I saw someone earlier this week in the clinic who has been unable to learn how to drive because the concept of making small talk in the car with the instructor is an absolute barrier for her. So I, I think it, it's, it's a, really, a really good point. Does that make sense? That, that, that everything you do, everything you want to join in, in is like, oh God, am I going to get on with the people? That it's more exhausting to, to get to know all the people and to interact with them than it is to actually just do the activity in the first place, yeah. I was just going to say that just chatting is a nightmare with many neurotypicals because they will take forever to explain a point that a, a, an autistic person can sum up in two sentences or... <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes. <laughs> life left in a few to I, I hope the neurotypical people in the room are learning something. That the, this is how the rest of the world talks about us most of the time. Christ, those autistic people, they're such a pain in the ass. I have a theory that, that, they don't, that they don't actually want to make a point. They just love hearing the tough talk. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think there's a, there's, there is a connecting thing about bonding. Just but it doesn't. The content is largely not terribly important, I think, to some non-autistic people. It's just about the bonding experience. What are you doing? That's a nice dress. Oh, it's sunny today. Blah, blah, blah that connects people. Is that right? That there's a connection? I think the problem with asking non-autistic people these questions is that they don't know the answers. I've done this a lot in training. Because it's so natural and intuitive, you've never had to examine it. So I think, I think for a lot of non-autistic people, they don't know how they make friends or what they do or anything because just I just know, they say. And you say, well, that's not really helpful. What are the rules? I something that has happened. Uh, that I think there's strong evidence is that when people chat, mm. they release oxytocin, yeah, yeah, okay. which is a hormone that makes people feel good. So actually, they may be talking drivel, but they're getting more and more high on oxytocin. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that there's a possibility. <laughs> Hold on. That <laughs> are, we know that the brain's wired up differently. I think there might be differences physiologically as well. So it could be that when autistic people talk, there is no release of oxytocin, therefore it doesn't reinforce itself. Whereas for neurotypical people, the more you talk, the more reinforcement you're getting, so you carry on doing it and carry on doing it. Now if you're not getting that oxytocin, you wouldn't carry on 
doing it, and I'm now carrying on doing it. How am I? Don't get that point in about two. Are you suggesting it's like the ending of that last, the last Predator movie, where the Predators want to get autism because they think it's the next stage of human evolution? I think that is strongly possible. Genuinely, the end of the next Predator. I think, yeah, I think that is absolutely strongly possible. Unless so, we, if we're releasing cortisol instead of exactly. Osmosis, Yes. That would explain why we want to run away. Yes. So and it's not, if moment. your interaction is not yeah. successful because yeah. your style of communication is different to the style of the person talking to you, then, then you're, not, you're not getting a cognitive feedback as well as a chemical feedback. Yeah. Then you just think, why bother? This is, this is not worth it. You, you, little, little boy at the back who was doing that thing that children do in the classroom, they go, oh, oh, oh. What did you want to say? She got some, no, she explained it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Good. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that when you were saying that neurotypical don't know the answer because they don't think about it because it's so intuitive, I think that's true, but I was also thinking it's a privilege as well because they're the majority, so they don't have to think about it. Yeah, that. no, absolutely. I just thought of that. Uh, but the problem for us is that we can't get any answers of, yeah, of, exactly. of someone going, well, how does it work? Tell me how it works. What does it feel like? And, and, and I, I've asked many, many people and they just go, well, I don't know. We just clicked. What, what's clicking? <laughs> we just connected. What's that? <laughs> they don't mean anything. I'm just flexing. What do you mean? What does that mean? I have no idea what you are. <laughs> There's an assumption that neurotypical people care. And I actually, my experience is that autistic people really care about the impact of themselves on others. Whereas I think neurotypical people actually, it's not they don't necessarily know, they don't care. They haven't invested any thought or feeling into... Because largely it's been relatively successful. Yeah, so and you've not needed to yeah. even consider it from a different perspective, yeah. So does that mean then that the level of self-analysis in the, in the general population is less than it is in the autistic population? Yes, I think so. For some. Think for some. So. Although autistic people are said to be very poor at self-reflection yeah. um, I mean, in well, general. It's something that you're forced, it's forced upon you by... Well, I think there's a range in the same as any population. Some people are utterly oblivious to the way they are and appear to other people, either autistic or not. I think there's probably a tendency in autistic people, if you have that tendency, to massively overanalyze, or not overanalyze, but analyze all of it all of the time. Could be, or it might just be analysis. Rumination tends to be sticking on something and, and struggling to move on, but, but analysis is... It's science. It's, it's watching something, changing the variables, doing something different, checking the reaction. It, it's, it's, it's engineering, essentially, isn't it? It's, um, I think autistic people are looking for a logic in friendships. Yes. I don't think there is a logic. No, no. So you're looking for something that actually isn't there. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. No, no, no. I, I, think, I think you're right. It sounded good, didn't it, Julie? I thought so. Is it useful? Is the, 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 the uh, relationship with another person of use to you? That's um, coming from someone yeah. who's been married to a non autistic person for 36 years. <laughs> yeah. And is that important? <laughs> is that important that the relationship needs to be useful to you in order for you to give it your energy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, which I think is perhaps just a different way of thinking about things. And, and again, going back to that idea of having a finite amount of energy, that I think my opinion, again, challenged me on this, is that autistic people do not maintain the numbers of casual acquaintances on the whole that non-autistic people do. They would probably have small numbers of people, uh, you might call them good friends, whatever, but to be constantly keeping up with 20, 30, I don't know how many people that are just sort of popping in and out of your life. I don't think I've ever met any autistic people that, that do that happily and comfortably. Does, does that kind of fit with your general experience or have you got billions of casual acquaintances? 
that's a very autistic thing. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they say, there's, a, there's an old saying, say, uh, a friend will help you move the house, a good friend will help you move the body. <laughs> 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 Well, well, there was that. No, I'm the body. He's moving. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that, that guy anime comedy accidentally killed. <laughs> what What you've just said is absolutely has been reported time and time again in autism research that autistic people make friends with people who share a tangible subject, topic, shared area of knowledge, whether that's because you're both parents or because you're you know, both interested in the same thing. Whereas quite often, obviously non-autistic people have those friendships too, but non-autistic people base their friendships on uh, personality and values and more uh, internal and intangible, intangible things. Um, I might have given you this example before. I, I, I was working a, a few years ago with a, a young man who wanted a girlfriend um, and I was helping him get a girlfriend um, and as, as a sort of mentor. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, what kind of person might you like to meet? And he said, uh, she has to live in Brighton, which is where we lived at the time, and she has to be in, into 1980s Japanese computer games. Well, a small pond you're fishing in, really, isn't it? And, and, and that was it. And, and, and I, said, I said, are you aware that some people have friends and partners who do not share the same interests as them? And the look he gave me was like I was just the maddest person. It was just... What? That's just rubbish. It was completely outside of, of his kind of perception that you might have friends that don't share the same interests as you. And, and I, I think from my experience, I don't know how that sounds to people in the room, but for, for a lot of autistic people, that's really puzzling. What would we talk about? Why? The question I come, dull. <laughs> Does anybody here have really good friendships with people who have your 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 friendship is not based at all over any commonality in an external subject or interest or sport or topic or anything he's mad about something that i've got no interest in but i can understand the obsession yeah because i get obsessed with things i'm so yeah just being obsessed is a common okay so that's a common interest yeah yeah, yeah. andy yeah just going back to the shared interest yeah i don't necessarily Agree with that. Okay. Because to that, I think that gets to acquaintance level. Right. And within that environment, you can be friendly. Yes. But it has to be external of that to build a friendship. Okay. In, in my view. So it has to be more personal. It's like in here, it's like there's a lot of people who can be friendly towards you. Yes. But would you see them outside there? Yes. Can you pass them to them? Yeah. So yeah. It has to be. Yeah. Okay, so for you it has to be about personality and humour and values and those sorts of things. Just a connection outside the particular venue. And what makes you connect to one person and not to another? Do you know? It's not, it's like slightly off thing, because that's not really what I'm talking about. Okay. It's, 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 it's literally to build a friendship. For example, I've been trying to go to a club and someone is friendly and supportive in that book. Mm. I don't know whether that's well it turns out it is just within that book. Yeah. And try and make friendship outside there and it didn't realise it isn't actually a friendship. Right. So when it's a shared interest, doesn't that necessarily mean that a friendship inside a particular event Sure. Sure, absolutely. I think I think the, the general point is that for autistic people, they wouldn't even begin that acquaintance level without something kind of shared in, in the first place. Did you want to say something, Keith? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, what is it that, uh, that makes a question to the small number of, of conventional people? <laughs> conventional people. That's a nice term. Can we adopt that clinically? Do you not like that? I'd rather be conventional. Oh, no, okay. You'd rather be typical. No. Although you're not, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. we don't like conventional. <laughs> they don't like that. <laughs> okay, my, my question is to the, the people who don't like to be called conventional. Okay. Uh, what is it then that um, enables uh, the initiation and, and the continuation of friendship? What is it? Fear of loneliness. Yeah. 
I don't think anyone knows. Yeah, I think you, like you just like them. So if you met 10 people and eventually, you, Sue, you can answer this as you're sitting there, and you eventually become deeper friends with one of those people, was there a point that you knew that was going to happen? Or did it just kind of naturally and organically happen that the other nine just stayed as acquaintances and this one you walked off into the sunset with them it is, yeah it just it does just kind of happen like yeah you, you yeah prefer being around that person yeah for yeah usually for me because of, i find them fun i like to be yeah. around them yeah and, yeah but, but it's not a day where you kind of went okay you're the one Probably not a day, but I think and sometimes you kind of get a feeling about, I don't know, it's not helpful, but sometimes when you just meet somebody... And yeah, just you, click. You just know. <laughs> yes, Esme. I was going to say, going on Sue's point, I think it's also convenient sometimes when you just throw people, say, at like school, like the school, work, yeah. whatever, and you just meet them and you just get to know them. Yes. Point, and then eventually it slowly but surely happens. I think I've sat there and gone, they are someone that I want to invest my time mm, in. I think it's mm. just like, you know, going, going out together just because you're in school and yeah, you go or yeah. sitting next to them. Little yeah. things, and eventually when you look back, you think, oh, actually, I'm quite close with that person mm. because of the situations we've been in. So there's something about it being a numbers game isn't yeah. there that if you're successfully interacting with large numbers of people you have a greater chance of more deeply interacting with a smaller a fewer uh, yeah, amount of people yeah yeah you just sort of see what people you can relate to. But you're not analysing that, are you? You're not kind of going, oh, no, they didn't do well over there. I'll, I'll take them off the list a little you know, bit or anything. Does, like, it sounds awful. It's just like a feeling. Like yeah. You see people act yeah. a certain way. You just get that sort of, mm. right, I'm not going to get yeah. near them as much. Yeah, yeah. It is a gradual thing. Yeah. I mean, if it was you meet someone one day, it's not a, oh, I'm going to meet them again because I really got on with them. Mm. Sometimes it is just like being in the right place. Sure. With yeah, something like about just... Frequency and proximity. Can I just ask you something? Do you think if, like, you had, you were limited and you were, like, told that you could only have a certain amount of friends, would you be more careful about this? Probably, yeah. Yeah, because I just wondered if that's it. Because, I mean, yeah. with autism, you sort of, well, in my experience, you sort of, you do need to put in more thought because it's like you have a low capacity for stuff. So, you, you know, you only have so many people you can know. I'm wondering if part of it is that, like, if, if you were told... Yeah, totally. If I, you know, I think as well, I, I do say myself, I only have sort of a close, good friends that I sort of invest my time in. Mm. Even, even, it's still draining to sort of like mm. go from person to person and be really close. Because when you've got friends, well, you take on, you care about them, so you take on their troubles and you take on what's going on in their life. Mm. I feel like you have loads of friends, it can be exhausting for anyone, but I definitely think... In terms of general, you know, good friends and then your friends, you definitely would limit the number of like general sure. friends. Sure. Yeah, have. yeah. The amount of interactions yeah. you have. Chloe, what did you want to say? I was going to build on the previous point about um, the environment you're in as well, because I've found that even though I don't have autism, a lot of time I'll be in a situation where someone is being friendly with me, whether it's like in work or, like you said, in the club, like. They're being friendly with me and I might be okay with them in that moment, but then again, going past them in the street, I wouldn't do anything. It's the mm. environment and I wouldn't necessarily call them my friends. It's just mm. kind of, so I think that's quite similar for us as well. Yeah. So, so again, I suppose it's that what makes the difference that makes you want to build on that and say hello to them in the street and go out for a coffee with them or something. I think for me, that's a joint effort on both parties sure. I wouldn't waste all my time investing into someone who's not going to give me anything back yeah, and I think yeah. I'd kind of drop that as well if they're willing to do that then I think oh, okay we're good friends we can keep and how would you know they were willing to invest their half of the effort I think you just see it with them wanting to go and do something or yeah yeah so you're reading the signals basically aren't yeah. you 
Yeah, we're not great at reading the signals, really. <laughs> and I think the problem is sometimes, I, I think you were saying about, you know, repeating yourself and, and not really knowing that sometimes I think autistic people miss opportunities where people might be being friendly and might want to engage with you because you've not picked up the signals and equally don't read the signals that somebody actually doesn't want to and so become a bit persistent. So I, I think sometimes we're, we, you know, we're kind of double whammied in a way of, of, of missing, missing things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So have other people found that they've clicked or connected more easily with other either autistic people or people that you think might be kind of kind of similar? Is that uh, uh yeah, yeah. Okay. And on that point of like, you know, sort of doing things with people, I always find that it's, it seems to me that does it takes on things with other people and they don't really take on for me. Okay. I also find that it's it's that point of um, generally the only thing I ask for is some time alone. And it always seems that the sort of friends I make can never give me that. Okay. And then they get angry when you don't answer the phone and things like that. And right. Yeah, just <laughs> so you're not making autistic friends because they'd be cool about that, wouldn't they? I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's just obsessive people. They just love you and want to be with you all the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, no, I say it's yeah. uh, so that's <laughs> 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 yes, Elliot. Uh, just to go on about friends, um, I remember a few years, um, a while ago, I had a fair, a fair bit of depression and I was going down, down quite a lot. And um, I had, it's funny, I had two types of friends. There was one who would try to cheer, both of them would try to cheer me up, but one of them legitimately worked, the other didn't. And I think that's sort of a difference between friends. Like, one of them's react way to, to try and cheer me up was to just go, smile, smile, a little bit better. I'm just like, why did I think of that? <laughs> Meanwhile, um, I have another friend who I've known pretty much my entire life. And he just, and um, whenever he sees me that I'm upset, and I'm around that hit, so you just go do something like, do you want to play with Crash Bandicoot? I'm just like, yeah, okay, and I'd be very happy because yeah. he didn't make a fuss, he didn't make a fuss about it, he just saw I was depressed mm. and tried it and tried to find a way to mm. ch try and cheer me up. Yeah, so I okay. Think that's what a uh, really good For you, a good friend is, yeah, absolutely. Ren, what were you going to say? Um, I, I, I tend to make friends where I, if I find something interesting or I, I feel I've got a rapport with someone, then I'll kind of, I'll, I'll extend a hand and maybe say, oh, would you like to go and do something? And then, kind of, when the friendship gets to like the next level, that might be if a person is struggling with something and they choose to divulge, then that kind of um, brings an emotional component to it and you can, you can see it kind of, you go from the next level. Yeah. Um, but before the first stage sort of starts to take place, before you kind of find something interesting, is when you sort of balance around and that sort of thing. If you're in a new situation where you meet a new group of friends or you know, just after working somewhere, you can start to find those bits that you find interesting or you think are you know, worthwhile things to have in front. Yeah. So it again, it seems to rely on the capacity to be able to manage large numbers of people at a very, very low social level in order for some of them to kind of filter through and get onto those next kind of kind of stages. Whereas I guess if you're struggling even to just say hello to somebody or how are you or whatever, that you're just, it's, it's a numbers game. You're just not generating enough 
kind of low level relationship. Did you want to say something, sir? No? No, yes, you, you, you looked keen. <laughs> you were just moving. <laughs> OK, Andy. Just um, an extension to that point. It's like maybe six seconds of judgment for body language and things like that. Sure. It's got to be because it's scared in the headlights most of the time. It's like the judge to being off limits from that. It's scared. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And yeah, and I think if, if you're not a natural kind of social smiler or somebody that's making eye contact and actively putting yourself out there, then I think you're right that the likelihood is that in those first few seconds you're you're kind of written off as serious or intense or scary or unsociable or, or any of those sort of things. What other things have other people been called? I've been called scary, intimidating, standoffish, stuck up. Just that's just random. Yeah, weird. <laughs> What's that? If anyone ever tells you it takes more muscles to frown than to smile, they're, they're wrong. In fact, you use 24, 23 muscles to smile and use 12 muscles to frown. You actually have to define what a smile is because of the research that I saw, no one could do that. People were claiming they could smile with their eyes which appears to be... It's called a smize, that, yeah. Well, it's just if your mouth's not moving, then there's no muscles that are actually changing. <laughs> Anyone who claims they can, sm uh, they can smile, smile with their eyes, I genuinely would like to poke them in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you smile now. That's what I thought. One of the most common things that comes up and it, it's particularly with women so, uh, in terms of diagnosis is the smile, it might never happen cheer up and I, I, I have a feeling that people say it to women more than they do to men I don't know why but there is a kind of feeling sorry <laughs> I think the, the standard name for this is resting bitch face now I think which never used to be the case yeah but other people must be doing something in the middle between psychopath and psychopath. <laughs> They're doing something else because nobody's shouting at them all the time to cheer up and what's the matter? What's the matter? Nothing. What's the matter? What? Nothing. <laughs> it's just that, like, we don't use our facial expressions no. as much. No. Like, they can sense something's weird about it, so they're like... Exactly, exactly, exactly. There are suggestions that autistic people age beautifully because we don't make that many facial expressions. So, ha! <laughs> when we're all 95, which most of us in this room already are, we will look beautiful and unlined. Um, <laughs> Although I'm not entirely sure that applies. Keith and I went on a, a little course a little while ago. Keith and I are virtually the same age. I'm 51, he's 50. And we, we went on a, a course with an instructor um, and the instructor was just telling us about, you know, that he was approaching 50 and, and we said, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're in our 50s as well. Me, he said nothing. He completely accepted it as that was true that I was in my 50s. Keith, he made lots of fuss and went, no, 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 you're not past 30. You're not past 30. And I'm standing there going, hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> and he had no concept that his absence of attention to me was more insulting than the attention that he gave to Keith and was convinced that Keith was certain. <laughs> well, now he's found out he's 50, maybe not. <laughs> yes, Andy. Just an extension to that again. Um, can I have an example this week? Uh, two examples, actually. Um, I was talking to someone who's actually qualified as a mental health nurse or a degree in mental health mm. and they're in, actually involved with autism um, in schools as you know, serious mental health, mental health and she's finding it a struggle to understand why people don't lie to get out of situations. Autistic people, Autistic yeah, people. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like uh, you're taught or encouraged to lie and be convincing you have to. Yes. And there's actually something on Radio 5 Live yesterday where there's a child 
and he had an imaginary friend. And the mother was encouraging her to tell her about this imaginary friend. And you can tell, just by the thing, she's making up this, this imaginary friend who's got a square face and a pink. And because it's a delayed thinking, she's just lying to her mother. Right. And it's almost like that's encouraged in neurotypical people mm. to develop communication. Yeah, because a small social lie is gentle, isn't it? Rather than brutally telling someone that they do look fat or... Uh, that with my friend, she say she couldn't understand. She says, well, it's easier to lie. But she couldn't understand why autistic people right. tell the truth. Why, why, is it, why is that not true for you? Is it easier to lie? Because I would say not. To lie, you've got to generate a believable alternative reality. And that, I think, for autistic people is incredibly hard. With you with having an imaginary friend. Yes. Perhaps autistic people in development yeah. have those imaginary friends. They don't? And, well, maybe not. I, I don't know. Sure. But I didn't. No. Some do, definitely. Very, very strongly. I still do. No, not at all. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I certainly, um, uh, your, your nurse friend assumption that lying is easier is, is n I would say that's not the case for autistic people. I, I think that it's enormously complicated. On the spot, why are you late? <sighs> Zombies? Dinosaurs? <laughs> Climate change, I don't know. They're, a plausible lie is extraordinarily hard to come up with on the spot. Yes, to try and encourage that. There's constant little white lies. Yeah, yeah. No, I think not. No, I think you're right, absolutely. There was a hand up there somewhere. Yes. All I was going to say is that. I understand what you're saying, but as somebody who I don't think is autistic, um, we use it as social glue. It's like it lies on to to me lies on the different category of lies, mm. and the sort of thing that you're I think you're talking about is is not something that you that I would consider necessarily a lie. It just makes the social thing go on. So it's good as to do you like my hair when we just had it cut. I would probably say yes, even if I thought it was hideous, because, and that, so that's what you like, making them feel better, not... Keith, be quiet. That's about making them feel better. For me, that is a white lie. Yes, I know, I know it's yeah. a lie, but yes, because Dominic's also, Dominic's also say to me, why do you, your articles always lie about stuff? Yeah, I know. Well, that's exactly the example I was trying to demonstrate. It's, 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 two different types of languages going, this is my social world, this is mine. But that's the reality that autistic people live in. We, we live in a, a largely non-autistic world where people find that acceptable and beneficial um, to do so. And we all know what happens when you tell the truth, that people say, oh no, I want your honest opinion, but they don't. They never, ever want your honest opinion. Even if you go, are you sure? Or they go, yes, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure. And then you give it to them and they cry or they run away. Don't ever believe anyone wants your honest opinion, ever. It's, I, in my experience, it's not true. A brilliant example of it. Uh, a great thing to look up is a uh, stupid excuse that people have given for why they've been caught speeding. Amazing, it's amazing. Well, the best one I ever heard was, a guy said, a bee got into the car and I thought by accelerating I would force the bee into the back of the car. <laughs> that makes absolute perfect sense. Yeah. I'll, I'll just do what, say what Hitchcock from Brooklyn Nine Nine says, I have nothing to live for and I drive like it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were children, who were your friends? Did you have them? Did you want them? Did they come around after school? Were they same gender, different gender, older, younger, similar to you, very different to you? Who, who were they? They all sucked. <laughs> My mum used to say to me, why do you make friends with all the people that no one else wants to be friends with? <laughs> and their parents were saying the same. <laughs> 
So who, who were your friends? No one. No one at all? And were you happy like that? Yeah, so was that at secondary as well? Or just no, 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 no. Like, back to junior. And then when I moved to the primary school, I was like, you know, like, came up with one or two of my friends. I was like, one or two of my friends. But in junior school, I didn't want any. Because I thought it was a good time. I'd get approached by other girls. And I'd be like, no, because I'm just having a time with them. That sounds brilliant and wonderful. <laughs> Anybody else remember who, who they hung out with? Uh, I am um, in primary school. Uh, I'm pretty sure I only had like one friend. I just remember um, I was a I had no friends till like year two. He just went up to me and said, "Want to play?" I was like, "Sure." And next thing, we, and next thing I realised, he ended up being one of my best friends for the last 15 years. Okay. Is, is do you think he's a bit neurodiverse? Um, I honestly, I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I always see, I don't know, again, it's more like they made friends with me. Yeah, yeah. people who wanted to be the leader. Okay. Like, I, I find that I tend to be better as a player. Right, so you're, a bit, you're more passive, you weren't initiating yeah. those sorts of things. Yeah, so if someone knows what they want to do, that's, that's easier for me, because I don't have to try and force them to do what Sure. Do. Does it also mean you don't have to use your imagination, which might be difficult, to actually come up with things to do? No, it's, it's not really that, because that's sort of like, it's just that if I'm going to use my imagination and come up with things to do, that would be things to, to do on my own. Really. Right, so okay. Not for, for the group. Friend, it's more like I have to, that's it, because okay. otherwise I don't really want them there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think initiation comes up a lot in a lot of autism studies that a lot of people, it, they're, they're either, like you say, quite passive and looking for kind of dominant people that will come and take over or the autistic person becomes the dominant one, perhaps with younger children, perhaps with other children that have different needs and difficulties. So it seems that what autistic people often struggle with is a totally equal peer relationship as children. Same age, same gender, same interests, that often autistic people are a little bit out of kilter with their, with their kind of surroundings and, and peer groups. Does that sort of make, make sense that you either preferred adults or you preferred smaller children or you like to take over and dictate or you kind of gave up and got mothered by other people it, it, it seems that that kind of just knowing what to do with same gender same age same development um, is is just really hard and and you stick out like a sore thumb in that group so if you're in a group of girls you're all eight years old and you're the autistic one and you're kind of talking about insects or whatever else and your clothes are a bit weird because you don't really understand what you're supposed to be wearing and you don't care, that you stick out like a sore thumb. You put that girl into a group of eight-year-old boys, we don't really have a problem. We're not comparing her on the same basis. She's suddenly a girl with a gang of boys. That's fine. That's, that, that's kind of OK. You put that girl with older children or younger children, again, you're measuring her differently. But it's only when you're with your peers that you really stand out as being developmentally or socially different in, in some kind of way. And I think often autistic people are quite clever not knowingly, uh, uh, kind of finding these other groups up, down, sideways, elsewhere, because you, you are more easily accepted as the only girl in a bunch of boys or you know, the only 10-year-old in a bunch of eight-year-olds. We, we, we kind of slot ourselves around with people that are different to us in order to disappear, I suppose, in, in some ways. There was a hand up just over there. We're gonna, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, when I was a child, I was um, a real tomboy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really not into being with dollies Mm. And they're all kind of tipper trucks, big sort of buses and coys toys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I went to boarding school. I had no friends at all, just had one sister. And she was kind of, she's older and was the leader and we played and that was it. We didn't have outside friends. Then I went to boarding school 
and because it was a school where we were all doing exactly the same thing day in and day out, only then did I start to make friends. But when I came home in the holidays, I was like a fish out of water. Mm. I, I mm. literally didn't speak to anybody for weeks on end. Yeah. The tomboy thing's very noted in, in females on the autistic even spectrum. I was shocked to see that I was always just, you know, even on occasions when we were dressed up in the going to events, mm. I was always sort of, my hair was up there, <laughs> dressed, and I had a big slodge on the front. And, <laughs> and so we're always having to drag me back, you know, can't play in the mud yet. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right, I think we must stop. We're only on slide two or three, two out of 12 or something, but never mind, we don't mind that. Um, uh, teas and coffees here, uh, cake will be there. Uh, did I see some biscuits? Did, some, did you make us some biscuits? One moment, please. We have additional biscuits as well as the cake. Shush. Can you tell us about your cookies? There's Anzac biscuits and shortbread. And what are Anzac biscuits? They've got oats syrup. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much for bringing them. Thank you. We're going to do that question after the break. Yep. Yep. Okay, let's stop. Uh, it's currently six minutes past, so 20 minutes or so, and I'll grab you all back. Uh, just before we do our last little bit here, um, the next session is... 16th of October, Wednesday the 16th of October. I'm looking around, hopefully, that that sounds about right. I'm sure that's right. Um, we have a, a, a very old friend of mine called Karen, uh, who is autistic, because all my friends are autistic, but we didn't know that when we knew each other. Has anyone found that, that you've met people that you didn't know was autistic and then, oh, you? Mm, that's right, that's why we're friends. Um, uh, she um, has worked with autistic people for forever um, and she's coming to do a, a little Pilates class with us. Don't run away. You don't have to take your clothes off or sit on the floor or do anything sweaty and weird at all. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows much about Pilates. I certainly don't. Um, but certainly it's something about movement and about posture and how that can affect your sleep and your anxiety and your well-being and all of those kind of things. So she's going to do a little bit of a talk about how there are some simple exercises that you can do at home in the privacy of your own home, which, which might help with, with some of those kind of aches and pains and headaches and sleepy kind of things. Um, and then she's going to demonstrate a few of those uh, here. So if you want to come along and you don't want to join in there's no laying down you're just sitting in a chair just as you are now you don't have to join in at all if you do want to join in then do maybe just make sure you're wearing something a little bit looser as I said it's all in a chair there's no rolling around um, um, don't let it put you off you know that we don't put you under any pressure to kind of kind of join in but yeah come along learn you, you know you might find something out that's that's kind of useful I know it's a little bit unusual for us and a little bit out of some people's comfort zone to, to watch that but you know that you will never be under any pressure to do to do any of those kind of things and then after we've done that we're going to get Linda who's incredibly dyspraxic and make her do Pilates <laughs> all by herself in the middle of the room <laughs> so that we can all feel better about how clumsy we are because it'll probably be worse <laughs> oh, oh my leg <laughs> We'll not ask you to show us that to prove it, though, will we? No, no, we won't. But no, do come along. It'll be interesting. Um, uh, it's the 16th um, of... And then in the, the one after that um, is um, another autistic woman called Lana Grant, um, who is mum of six children. Um, and she's going to come along uh, and again she's worked in the field of autism for many many years for Birmingham Council which is where she lives as a trainer and a speaker and a coach and she's going to come and tell us all about her experiences or not just about kids um, she wrote a book called From Here to Maternity uh, about, if you like a good pun uh, about her, her, her life and pregnancies of, of her six children um, so she's going to come along and talk to us in December to just have a different a different experiences and knowledge and all of that kind of stuff um, and then I'll be putting together a program for next year 
Um, so if anybody has any burning topics or interests or has something they can offer us to come and do a presentation for us, then uh, I'm very happy to hear your ideas and thoughts and, and all of those kinds of things. Anybody have any thoughts off the top of their head what they might like to know about that we haven't talked about? Just drop, e drop Axia an email and, and just say that you've got an idea. If you. The law of dark souls. That's one for you then. Shall we put you down for March? No, not this. <laughs> <laughs> Heckle me at your will, Calvin. Dark souls. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Linda said, you know, last time I dared to go on holiday um, and Linda uh, took over the session and did a Q&A with you. Yep. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you'd like to do that, we'll, we'll make sure we book one of those in for, for next year sometime. Um, I'll try and coincide it with a holiday again. <laughs> it's the only day off I'm allowed a year, so, you know. It's yes. the 17th of um, October, and then the next one's the 15th. Is it 17th or 16th? 17th. Oh, okay. 2018. Okay, 16th. 16th. Okay, um, I'm not gonna get through all these slides, so I'm not even gonna try. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so we'll, we'll just kind of perhaps carry on a little bit where, where, we, where we left off. One thing that comes up quite frequently is, you know, about this whole kind of friendship thing is people feeling that they really struggle to, to get into a conversation if two people are talking and you're on the edge. Does that anything that other people experience, that you can't find the gaps? What do you do? What's the secret? Sort of interrupt and then yeah. I feel like then I'm not liked very much. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to be there and want to be included. Yeah. Desperately wanting to be included. Yeah. Then it just goes. But what do you think you're doing? You're just a touch too early or too late or you're just missing a you gap? Don't really want to be in the conversation. Okay. Okay. So you think you might have not read the signals before you did that or something no i noticed that they seem to go out and socialize outside yeah like yeah smoking break yeah and i think well stuff you just try to <laughs> i go out as well because yeah. i i have to then be involved with everything that's going on sure sure and yeah I yeah think that's not fair if there's smokers they should go and smoke one at a time. Right. It's just a preach. <laughs> <laughs> the, smoke, the smoking ban is literally the stupidest idea that's ever happened. It's criminalised smokers to an absurd degree. So if it's that bad, just make it illegal, for Christ's sake. Just have smokers and non-smokers only socialise with smokers and non-smokers. Let's stick to the topic, shall we? Mm -hmm. So, yes, Jamie, what were you going to say about the same thing? What you said just reminded me of a thing that I found out that was really weird. I was at, I was at work and two people were having a conversation like, yeah. right next to me yeah and so i was thinking oh i can join into the conversation because yeah. if i wanted it to be private they would go elsewhere sure but one of my one of my uh, autistic friends who knows things more than me was like no you're meant to pretend to ignore that right like, what right that made no sense to me and i just wondered if that Made sense yeah. Else also Does anybody else kind of just understand this difficulty? Particularly, I think if it's one to one, it's not too bad, is it? Because it's kind of obvious that, that it's just the two of you. But when you get a third person, either you joining or someone else joining, that it all goes. Yeah. Yeah, because that was 10 minutes ago and they're going, what? <laughs> We've moved on from that. <laughs> Anybody else have that kind of getting in? Yes. I'm incredibly shy, right? But I find myself just suddenly saying something and I get two reactions. One is like, shock, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. All the other is, oh yes, that's very good, thank you very much. Because I quite often tell people in supermarkets what they should be buying. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at Colgate and I'll say their own brand's much cheaper. Okay. And so that usually goes... That's on. helpful. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, it does get me some funny reactions. Yes. 
But because I was so late diagnosed, I've been used to having weird reactions. From sure, people sure. Life. So it's now I just sort of like think, ah, oh, autism. You're just going to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. I think sometimes we're too quiet or look invisible or don't almost take your space up in the world. I, I find that sometimes if I was standing at a bar in a pub, which is very rare, I'm quite a big person, but people don't see me. I, I, I think I, I'm, I'm very quiet. Uh, in, you'll find that hard to believe, it's true. Um, and I, I'm, I tend to kind of, rather than ask people to move out of the way, I'll try and move round them and sort of sneak round them. And then they kind of get a bit freaked out when they find that you're there. And I think sometimes it's almost like we don't, I don't, don't always take up the space in the world to kind of go, I'm here, here is my presence, uh, that I'm, I'm there. But I, I quite often feel that people are surprised that, that I'm there at all. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah, I think so. Just being kind of slightly invisible and... To, yeah, just, just not. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Slightly freaked out by that. I think by the time you're 50 odd, it's incredibly to tell one from the other. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this talk of sort of masking and camouflaging. I think there's a lot of. of of people of my age we couldn't switch it off if we tried because it's just what you do it's just there it's just what you do you know it's it's the performance that that gets you through life i suppose yeah yeah ab ab absolutely but i think i think there's something about just not taking up space in the world because maybe you've been negatively considered so you just sort of Around, just yeah. sneak around and try and get what you need without, you know, too much yeah, yeah, without existing really, which kind of takes us into another whole psychological, mental health kind of stuff, I suppose, really, yeah. Um, is it got anything to do with these sort of cues that we don't give off? Because I find this, you know, like when you're walking in the street, always seems to be me that has to move out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just walk into it. Like, yeah. 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 It's something like a. a I don't. I don't know. No idea. But it, it does seem to be quite um, you know, commonly reported. I've had, I've had this usually in a work environment. It's probably because you're walking a bit faster than them, so they're expecting you to go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know this one where like people ask them like, oh, didn't you come in? It's yeah. Like, are we just incredibly stealthy? <laughs> <laughs> it's a superpower. <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> so for people who are not autistic, does does that make any sense to you? That feeling of feeling invisible, of people not knowing that you're there? Does that ever happen to you that people are surprised to see you? <laughs> Really yeah, 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 yeah. I think everybody in the world thinks that they're the ones that are moving. Yeah, that I think, I think, and yeah. The, the neurotypical, I have a, a son with autism and I have a good friend here today. Uh, and I, 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 I just want to say to you all, please don't think it's a bed of roses in the neurotypical world, because it isn't. And people have the hang-ups that all of you have too. Yours are, are, will obviously be exaggerated in many, many aspects, as I see with my own teenage son. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a tough world out there for everybody. And, yeah, I always feel like I'm the one who apologises on mm. the pavement or mm. whatever. I can get a bit narky about that in the supermarket. Wherever I go, I'm in the way. Mm. You know, so mm. it can happen to me. Yeah, to okay, me. thank you. I think because you are, because people with, with autism and, and many issues probably analyse very deeply what's going on around mm. It probably feels like you're being victimised sometimes. I think so. Yes, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a funny old world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. If that gives you any comfort. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I have seen people walk in sweat. Yes. Where they've missed me. Yes, so to yes. Where sometimes I actually walk in front of him. Right. So that, yes. So, know, so there's there is some kind of invisible force field of something. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's interesting. That's our space. Yeah.
that there's something magical that goes on between a lot of neurotypical people. There's something that they that they do with the faces that means, right, I'm going that way, so yeah. you need to go that way. Yeah, and yeah. And I don't get that. I, I right, don't yeah, the kind of reading, yeah, yeah, yeah. moving around people and things yeah. like that, yeah. We yeah. warm together. Well, we can actually see it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bumping in. You haven't got your sat nav on. <laughs> right, okay. You never had that problem when he carried a rifle. So that. <laughs> yeah. Let's not advocate that, shall we? I think there might be a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a problem a problem with that. Right, we just got a few minutes, Linda. What did you want to say? I, I want to try and do this respectfully, but I looked at a lot of people's faces when I understand why you said what you did about it's a hard world out there, but I. I think people who are autistic are victimised on a daily basis. Oh yes, I took. And you. also more than victimised are abused. And I, th in some ways, it isn't helpful. I understand you said it in a helpful way. In some ways, it isn't helpful to say to autistic people actually, it's a hard world out there because it's a bit like saying we're all a bit autistic. Well, that's like you know you're either pregnant or you're not. <laughs> and I think that we really. So this group is where a space where autistic people can say this is really shit out there on yeah, a daily absolutely. basis. And it is often. And a, is. So the world is much, much harder and it takes much, much more energy. So I'm, I'm glad that you said that, but I felt I, had, I saw a lot of faces in the room and I had to respond to that. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I, I would say as an autistic person, I think, you know, we, we, end, up, we end up back into that autism is a terrible tragedy. And, and I think that although the stuff we're talking about today is about people and for the most part, most of us find the people bit of life harder than the average non-autistic person, probably. But actually, I think there are other bits of life that we probably find a lot easier than other people, um, which are much more in line with who we are as well. So I, I, I don't want it to be all about kind of like, God, this is awful and crap. And, and, and the problem of, of talking about friendships and relationships is, is that often we end up going, actually, it is really difficult to be heard. And yes, we do feel invisible. And I don't have any solutions for that. And I don't think any of you do either. But all I can hope and we can hope is that actually by knowing that you're not alone, does that mean anything to know you're not alone? Does that help or does it not help because it's not a solution? And that's the logic of it that says, well, what are we talking about it for if we can't solve it? And that's a very particularly sensible autistic thing to do. But I would like to think that actually to kind of know, well, actually, yeah, that does happen, doesn't it? That's interesting. And that we might just have to accept some of this and just kind of crack on anyway, because we aren't going to change it um, in, a, in a massive, massive way. But the awareness of it means it's not personal. You're not being ignored. You're not being sidelined. For some freak of nature, the communication between you and the people you're trying to communicate with is just not really working. You're not quite loud enough. You're not assertive enough. You're not making the eye contact. You're not reading the turn taking quite well. And it's just kind of not quite going. But that's not your fault. It's a 50-50 deal here. Uh, and that rather than just kind of feeling really negative about that and going home and going, oh, God, I just kind of give up, that hopefully you end up feeling resilient enough to just give it another crack another day. Because you never know. The person that you tried to speak to that didn't respond to you, something really crap might have happened to them. Maybe they didn't see you. Maybe they didn't hear you. Maybe they were busy doing something else. And I think as autistic people, because we have a bad experience, we can quite easily go, OK, that's it. All experiences will be exactly the same. I therefore, and every negative experience you have, you therefore stack up your evidence for negativity. But actually, it might be that you just picked a bad person on a bad day and that maybe tomorrow it, it might be it might be different. Um, it's not personal. People are not going out there and going, you, I don't want to be your friend. They're just not. They don't care enough to do that. And that's a good thing. People are not staring at you. They're not really that fussed. 
their interest in you passes as soon as you get out of their vision. They're not going home and ruminating about you. They're not. They just move on quite quickly. And that's a really good thing. That allows us to get off the hook. It means that people aren't going home and going, God, did you see that person? They were weird. They're not. They've moved on from that. They're thinking about They've something else completely. In their lives. Exactly. And I think we can internalise that and go, it's all about me. I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. I always fail. And actually, the chances are it's just not. It's just bad luck. People aren't generally as observant. So even though it's really yeah. obvious to us, other people might not notice. So that, you know, yeah, exactly. I remember working with somebody and he was obsessed that people were looking at him and, and all these, you know, they're thinking this, they're thinking that, they're thinking this and, and, all, and really, really to the point that he could barely leave the house. And so he and I went out for a walk down a busy street um, and, and some people walked past and I said, I said, what do you think of those people? And he went, oh, not really. I, you know, I noticed, I noticed, oh, no, they're gone. And I went, that's what people are doing to you. You're that fast. You might observe, oh, haircut, glasses, tall, big, small, black, white, whatever. It's gone, hasn't it? The thought's gone. You, you can't even remember who you saw 10 minutes ago. Um, and that was really helpful to him to go, oh, OK, so what I'm doing to other people is what they're doing to me. They're not ruminating and going, do you see that bloke? He was weird. And continuing to have that thought. They're just not. And, and I think that's useful for us to remember. We're not that important. And that's a good thing. It means that you know, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not bothering people in the way that we think. They're just moving on very, very quickly. And, and that, that's, that's a good thing. And that's perfectly fine. So on that note, I shall finish. So I'm really sorry. You've only got two slides to look at today. I'll, I'll let dream. Probably left on the website. <laughs> no, because then I'll, I could do this again another day. <laughs> We'll go deeper into relationships another day. But thank you very much for coming and taking part and listening and all of those kind of things. Um, and um, you're, you're brave and wonderful people. So uh, please come for Pilates, but you really don't have to take part. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.